Among the Eskimo of Hooper Bay, Alaska, the kayak was the basis for all wealth and well-being. Today, however, the kayak has almost disappeared from southwest Alaska, with Hooper Bay the only major center for its continued use. In the fall of 1976, I first went to Hooper Bay and met Dick Bunyan, a 69-year-old master kayak builder. He agreed to construct a kayak frame for the National Museums of Canada. Curved parts of the kayak were made from driftwood stumps of the same curvature to obtain maximum strength. Dick Bunyan split off the needed pieces from the stumps with a hatchet, wooden wedges, and a maul, again to preserve the natural grain for maximum strength. Braids of drying tomcod will be eaten later in the winter. After first roughing out pieces with a hatchet or axe, Dick then refined their shape with very skilled use of an adze made from grinding down and rehafting an old hatchet blade. Dick's sharpening stone came from a traditionally known place on the banks of the Yukon River. The first parts of the kayak made were the deck beams, one of which is shown by the arrow.
final shaping of a part was usually accomplished with a traditional Eskimo knife that has a short curved blade and a long handle that rests against the arm. The 60 or so different pieces that make up the Hooper Bay kayak frame are all individually prefabricated and painted before any actual assembly takes place. The only measuring devices used are the eyes, some straight sticks, and various anthropometric measures such as arm span, hand span, elbow to thumb tip, and so forth. The driftwood used for all parts of the kayak is black spruce. Floating down the Yukon and other major rivers, the often substantial sized driftwood logs are deposited on the beaches near Hooper Bay, but only when wind and tide conditions are just right. Sometimes up to two years pass before this happens. This log is being split to make the fore and aft deck stringers. A number of times while Dick Bunyan was busy elsewhere or was constructing parts similar to those I had already seen, I traveled with his neighbor, Aloysius Hale, to see a kayak in use. While the major use of the kayak was in the hunting of sea mammals, it was also used in a number of fishing activities. Here, Aloysius is setting out for whitefish, a favorite frozen snack. In the fall, these fish may be caught with a gill net in the shallows of the bay. The most efficient method to set and tend the net is with a kayak carried on board the homemade flat-bottomed skiff. The kayak then acts as a tender to the more unwieldy large skiff.
Aloysius checked the net on the incoming tide every 20 minutes or so, but he only caught one fish for an hour's work. The groove seen on the piece here is cut into many parts of the kayak, as well as other items of material culture. The reason for this groove, however, is lost in the distant past, as is the reason for the traditional red paint put on all kayak parts. The gunnels, made from a single driftwood log, are the major longitudinal strength members in all kayaks.